So I want to, uh, they approached me last evening and I, it's, it's a delight. They can't ask me for anything and I won't do it. And I've been part of the student group for, for successive years now. And I enjoy the interactional pattern. I want to talk about a way of knowing. And I've been developing a series of um, ideas on indigenous way of knowing. And I just wrote a major speech on words. What, what does it mean when we talk? Uh, and how we have to attach significance to those words. And today I just want to talk about one component aspect of ways of knowing, African ways of knowing, which is non-Western. And I want to focus on what I call ritual archives. If, there had been, if, if you're interested in the topic, just send me an email and I will send you the full speech. Let me start by the definition. I mean a conglomeration of words as well as tests, ideas, symbols, shrines, images, performances, and objects that document as well as speak to religious experiences and practices that allow us to understand the African world through various bodies of philosophies, <coughs> literatures, languages, histories, and many more. By implication, ritual archives are extensive. They are unbounded in scale and scope. They store tremendous amounts of data on natural and supernatural agents, on ancestors, goddesses and good and bad witches, on life, death, festivals, the interactions between the spiritual realms and human, be human beings. To a large extent, ritual archives constitute and shape knowledge about the visible and invisible world with the forces that breathe and are breathless, as well as secular and non-secular with destinies and within cities, kingships, medicine, environment, sciences and technologies. They contain shelves on sacrifices and shrines, names, places, incantations, invocations, and the cosmos of all the deities and their living subjects among human and non-human beings. <coughs> And I'm deploying this term in relation to rituals as a means of challenging the conventions of Western archives. And that's one of the reasons why I'm proposing this. And at the end of the lecture, I hope I'm able to convince you because I'm creating it as a distinctive category of its own, different from what many of you are trained with, the parameters of Western archives. What is it that is deemed worthy of preservation and organization as data, whether or not it is interpreted at any given time? My intervention is not to restrict archives inside the location of the library or university or museum, because that's the idea of the Western-based archives, that we create a space for them, we give it a name, and we confine them in a specific, in a specific place and you visit them uh, just as researchers do. I'm also trying to apply the techniques and resources of academic archives to rituals so that there can be greater preservation and valuation. And I had the metaphorical and mystical sense of archive, one that does not require residency in the academy. In other words, ritual archives are outside of the space uh, that you conventionally deal with. And I'm insisting that the dimension of archive that is not fully collected, but it retains power and agency in their own invisible ways. And I'm trying to offer a provocative exploration, exploration of the category of archive itself, 
coupled with the revolutionary insistence on expanding our understanding of it through an elevation of the significance of ritual as a name, because I was searching for a name, and I, I said, okay, let me use that, for a large component of cultural meaning making. How do we contend <coughs> with the destruction of archives via various forms of violence? Can we even clarify with certainty what can and cannot be reclaimed? A countless number of sages and priests, devotees and practitioners created oral and visual libraries which are linked to ritual complexes and secular palaces. Cultural knowledge has extended from the deep past to a present day. It is through their knowledge that historians and traditions were constituted while identities were formed and philosophy as we know it emerged. Although learned people were part of the community, they were there as ordinary members while others considered the leadership. Today, without specific names, we label the originators of knowledge collectively as the past and as traditions, which go a long way to create for us access to the past. In the process, the traditions in ritual archives provide templates for the future. The contents of the archive become the philosophy literature and history. Their interpretations become manifested in our present as part of our engagement with heritage and modernity. Just as in poems, ritual dances, sacred drums, ritual textiles, components of the archives can be isolated, but they can also be combined into a body of interlocking ideas and philosophy in the context of the broad terrain of ancestral knowledge. Whether you aggregate them or you disaggregate them, ritual archives fully encode memory and remembrance in various ways and forms. They store most of our indigenous practices and the archives lead us to the reinvention of the cosmos that you and I inhabit, different from, but not useless to what modern science does. Why postulating that there's a coloniality of archives that is, archives from resulting from the colonial encounter, built on the template of Western knowledge, I want to deduce that it has served us in a colonial and post-colonial world in a number of ways. However, it has not only proven to be severely limited, that's the coloni colonial archives, in terms of their intellectual possibilities as well as scope, but it is also an agency of control that frames our subjectivities and objectivities, and indeed, how we can pursue them. And for those of you who have used all these colonial archives, you, it's very easy to, to fully grasp that they cannot answer many questions. And during question and answer time, I will explain why. The colonial archive has been imposed and given prominence over the ancestral ritual archive, leading to the erasure and degradation of indigenous perspectives and local talents that the late Kizabo called the endogenous. In fact, nothing reveals the shallowness of the colonial archive more than the very time frame of its contents are able to cover. If you visit the National Archives in Ghana or Nigeria, using the example of West Africa, or in Kenya, the restored archives, they all speak to no more than 65 years, a continent that assisted before BC, and the colonial archives we work with only store records that are less than 70 years. And that in, in itself tells you a severe limitation. Contributions in those colonial archives are crowded within the colonial time era, and after decolonization, many of them have been left to their own devices as post-colonial leaders struggle to make themselves leaders for life. And as to the time before, only the long 19th century has had a few interpreters. Regarding the post-colonial era, its archivable knowledge has basically been confined to the media. Why we struggle for sheer economic, political, and cultural survival, histories of centuries between the Stone Age and 18th century have either been left to rot or easily ignored and in the process 
lost in many parts of Africa. This loss is a function of lost archives. And sadly, there is disregard for those archives that can still be reclaimed in the case of ritual archives. The contention that the past was unrecoverable became a mythical thought or assertion that many people came to accept simply because of how it was packaged by the coloniality of knowledge, which unfortunately diminished the possibility of the use and transformation of our collective memories. The very incapacitation of ritual archives is by itself an example of what you will call an epistemic violence. The foregoing two archives, competing but not complementary, have created a knowledge divide. The colonial one that is aligned to power, both external and internal power, and the ritual that is aligned with marginality. As we look at the great works of Eric Williams, Dubois, and others, ritual, the ritual feeds the colonial as raw materials, by and large, existing permanently in the shadows and dominance, sometimes in the mode of what Nkrumah referred to as neocolonialism. Indeed, the archives of coloniality privilege methodologies that go a long way toward advancing the projects of European concepts and legacies, to say nothing of economic and political interest. Ritual archives, on the other hand, deal with ancestral legacies and indigenous concepts and epistemologies. History, as defined in the colonial archives, is different from how Africans define history. And using the Yoruba example, which is called Itondea, and you can use Zulu example, Indubili example, just as I'm speaking. And you can replace this with Ito. And you are going to reach the same conclusion. While Ito is based on ritual archives, you assess this within the realm of folklore or mythologies in the academy. Analysis of colonial archives are assessed in the categories of originality and validity in the same academy. So we distort one. We distort that which is indigenous in its conception, and we call one valid and original. Uh, and then the one that is organic, we label it as mythologies, uh, a process of undermining them. In the Western conception of historical knowledge, indigenous conception, as in the example I'm giving, lacks validity, while academic history is imbued with it. The indigenous is unreliable. But history, as we teach on campuses, is the indigenous is not accessible and transparent, but the academic history, we say it is. Yet, the indigenous entails and binds both historical and geographic knowledge in ways the Western conception of knowledge can never do. As an assessment of Western education, a new elite acquires new forms of knowledge for mobility, derationalizing the pre-Western, begrudgingly absorbing indigenous worldviews while distancing themselves from the previous keepers of established indigenous knowledge. A mytho-historical knowledge system or a historical epistemology has been ruptured, replaced by a formal Western system invested with colonizing values of progress and modernity. The larger part of what I want to talk about is to give examples of the contents of ritual archives. And some of them, you've already seen them, only that you do not treat them as archives. And I, many of you have dealt with written literature, oral literature, ritual performances, physical representation of goddesses and gods, uh, you've communicated them in routine expressions of proverbs, songs, poetry. You've, you've encountered them in beads. You've seen them in, in landscape, but you do not see them as an archive to create interpretations. And I also want to say that there are dimensions of epistemology and ideologies sometimes that 
are considered differently from the colonial archives and is a body of knowledge on a wide range of issues, including but not limited to cultural cognition, ideas and idea formation, semiotics and education. And at the tail end, I would argue that we could use ritual archives to create concepts of pluriversalism. The goal is to revalidate ritual archives in Western-derived academies like this, for us to begin to involve indigenous practitioners in research and knowledge dissemination and to take them more seriously, to formulate evaluation mechanisms to authenticate indigenous knowledge and those who communicate them using data-driven and emic standards. At all the levels of the educational system, indigenous ways of knowing, along with the knowledge and researchers of those accumulated knowledges, must be fully blended with the Western Academy. Ritual archives tell us that we must review and question our externally derived approaches and the limitations of the methodologies we deploy. Western derived disciplines, religious studies, history, philosophy, have carefully fragmented ritual archives, but it is time for all those disciplines to combine to provide an understanding of the centers of indigenous epistemologies, to unify their ontologies and convert them to theories that will be, pre that will be treated as universal. And there are some examples we can use, and I've taken that of divination uh, in West Africa, that if we have turned inwards and look at some of these ideas and convert them to departments, we will have done ourselves a lot of good and we will have created disciplines and departments that are deeply organic to us and we will, we will have been posing different kinds of questions. As scholars dealing with Africa, questions must be posed as to how you and I understand and apply indigenous knowledge which border on values and cultures in our research and teaching. Should we grant the analysis and understanding of our field solely in Western-derived epistemologies? No. Which means that the preeminent alternative we have is to return to the source, to borrow the phrase of Amica Cabra. And we cannot return to that source by ignoring those archives. We just have to use them. Indeed, while we study practitioners and others who create archives for us, the others have not studied us. And sadly, we have not studied ourselves either. I will therefore put scholars in conversation with ritual archives in order to highlight the voices that, are, that we ignore, we don't even hear them, and we delegitimize them in academic spaces, pointing to the contents of ritual archives as a source of multiple epistemological as well as methodological, political, and cultural messaging. If my voice breaks, it is because uh, my throat uh, is dry uh, because of travel. I also seek to interrogate, interrogate broader academic concerns, hugging against the constant recentering of universalism, reproducing colonial domination, and allowing the empowerment of alternative voices. An understanding of ritual archives is an important process to edify Africa in terms of the constitution of knowledge and the social historical process by which identities are created, practiced, transformed, dominated, and destroyed. So what do I mean? And in this part, I will skip. I just want to offer examples. So I will say, you are studying gods and goddesses, or you are studying cosmos. They generate around them a wide range of tests and sounds, visible and invisible symbols, objects and signs. Orality in itself is very extensive. There is no limit to it. Comprising parables, proverbs, tales, allegories, dilemma stories, drums and musical compositions, go with venerations, along with sacrifices, 
with practitioners and priests, with their insignias and dress, rituals and ritual speech, connect you with kingship and power systems. And they tell you about the nature of power and society, offerings, food. You identify them with deities. Songs have connections with spaces, with ideas. A lot of storehouse of knowledge on women and gender. And you have you find a few books that have dealt with some of these examples. Then you have the large terrain of objects. As we rework the complexities around the deities to modern disciplines, what we do is to disaggregate these archives into many component units. It is you and I who take that archives and call them literature, music, drama, psychology, and things like that. And experts work around each component so that you can study one component and I study the other without you and I actually combining them and framing them in terms of these epistemologies they represent. And I've taken examples, say, from divination in West Africa and show how they have autonomous epistemologies uh, that we need to do more with in terms of how we frame knowledge. I'm trying to skip uh, many of, of these examples, uh, but I'm sure you can come up with your own examples as I talk. Uh, and, and irrespective of the example you take, you, you see how uh, th they speak to a large body of ideas. Even our plants, organic matters and objects, kula nuts, cowries, testiles, paintings, sculptures, they, they tell us a lot. Uh, and for, for in our, our colleagues in Brazil and others, uh, I've, I've connected uh, plans to ideas, ideas on, on, on the diaspora, ideas on worship, and, and the complexity of, say, candomblé, how they've used it to frame ideas around Afro-Atlantic world. Then you, you have the bigger space of objects, and these are many, and we can study objects. Objects speak and they communicate without words. Objects supply narratives. They encourage the creativity of storytelling and they facilitate performance. And you can think of any objects of your own. They can be beads, they can be sculpture. But once you begin to break them, they speak to you uh, in, in, in various ways. Uh, they encode the characters of the being they represent, even telling us if they are odd or cool headed, calm, volatile. Colors are denotative, as in red, in some cultures for being aggressive and quick tempered, white for being calm. This is not my interpretation. I took this from the Yoruba use of color in relation to gods. In that contract is a binary, but the point is to say even the range of colors open a library. Objects have been treated as museum pieces with short descriptions to describe them rather than as archival items. Again, you see the danger in accepting borrowed ways of thinking. Yet such objects actually fit into the description of an archive as a place to keep historical records, although the collection of objects may defy categorization. Kola nuts, which many of you have not seen but you've read in novels, are historical records. The location of an archive may be characterized as an archive itself, as in the grove of a ritual tree, where the tree and its location constitute a library. Documents in an archive are treated as primary sources. So also should many ritual objects be treated as such as they communicate messages that can be used to reconstruct the past and understand various ideas about the world. Objects open a wide door to a large body of mythologies, stories, legends, many saints. The categories are many, 
Some are like written records created for a specific meaning that is communicated from one person to another or from one generation to another. Such objects may be connected with signs, and there are many. All cultures have signs. Signs in which objects create meanings, as in the case of cowries, to formulate a code which you have to decode and they generate long tests and interpretation. Ritual communications were not uncommon from messages, from dreams to divinations. And like archives, some objects are permanent records, like cemeteries, for instance, uh, which you have everywhere. And what does a cemetery tell you? Uh, if not stories of those who lived there at a point in history. Uh, ritual objects supply tests on the environment and open us to multiple words of charms, magic and medicine. They tell us histories of places, history of landscapes, and I've given various examples here. Have we approached history through plants? Not many of us have done so, but it's a knowledge system. And there are plants that have opened a lot of door into how we understand all sorts of ideas and meanings. And I use an, ex an example here, which I live, which has crossed the Atlantic, uh, which you find in stories, in metaphors, uh, and as part of history. You can also, as I said before, take your own example, sculpture, paintings. These are abundant, but there are connections with historical writings. We have to strengthen them. They tend to be used more as book covers than as elaborate tests within the books. Yet images are philosophical expressions, connected with thought and life. Located in museums, we tend to see and appreciate them, not necessarily engage in dialogue with them, However, images represent mentalities, power, and strength. Images can be used to generate image theories and create extensive narratives on cultures, transcultures, and intercultures. They supply critical issues on hybridity. To carve an object is about the representation of self, history, identity. One image of a show is, is um, a Yoruba god, and I did a book on this god. He fascinates me a lot. Tells us about social and cultural issues. Portrayal of multiple and ambivalent ideas. Representations of hybridity. Discourse and difference. Perception. Semiotics and religion. Multiple specializations can emerge around image theory, image critical methodologies, image anthropology image and culture, image philosophy, perception and seeing, listening, silences, and image styling. Just one image. It can open a wide range of discussion. An image moves you towards the spiritual and religious, but there's an aesthetic idea living within it, allowing for tests on cultures, forms, and styles. And I've seen some of you, we are in those images without knowing that uh, we are in an archive. Why gazing without talking? You create a test, saying something, creating what you can call an army of metaphors. An image generates a wide range of imaginations and thought systems. An issue image, my own example, like the ambiguity of issue itself cannot be read in an interpretive singularity. The image has ideas within itself and ideas outside of itself. Seeing the image is to see force and strength, power, epistemic responses that connect back to language and metaphysical perceptions. The image is about the body in its physical and non-physical realms. An element in the body gestures to sexuality and yet another to the sanctions of transgressions. The politics of images lead us to the pregnancy of culture, ready to give birth to social issues. In its external outward look, 
you move to the realm of beauty, visual effects, conversation on everyday practices, languages and word creation, forceful inscriptions of perception and experience onto our consciousness. Look further. Using just this tiny image of a show, it unfolds more dimensions around performance. And other bodies of knowledge open, opens up in bigger knowledge systems. The thought that you express to yourself as you look at, at an image and to others will move you back to the issue image. Its force becomes a part of you. Whether you hate or like issue, the image is activated. In the process, you must generate tests around the image, expressing your philosophy, your opinions, your religiosity. That image, to take my example, has entered into your mental system. Active in your conversation with yourself and others, your thought is a test on the physical world and on the afterlife, on mythologies, on religion, and more. An artistic, an artistic production becomes a body of knowledge at various levels, political, cultural, and social. Image transfers you to the understanding of culture and society, even if it is the bead you are wearing. What is left of the past and how the past is reformed, deformed, transmogrified, ordered, and reordered. The past may even be disappearing, and that image can affirm it for you. What originally appears as a small wooden object opens up a fastness of knowledge. Its edges become borderless. Its existence acquires a force. We are no longer dealing with the aesthetic of difference, as in looking at the objects in the British Museum in London and looking at an object, say, in Pretoria. We are forced to move into the orbits of knowledge in which all component parts of the body become signifiers, as in my example uh, of the issue object, uh, in which the body, the spiritual, all the calculations begin to change as you look at different components of the body. And as you use your eyes, you are beginning to also connect your eyes to your brain, and you are connecting your visual effect to your inner essence and your perception. You can be confused, all well and fine. And following the conversation of that con confusion, you begin to create a different kind of knowledge in which that confusion may expose your wisdom or may portray you as stupid. An image coupled with all other objects, as well as all tests and the entire ritual archives, lead us to the indigenous intellectuals and the epistemologists. When you combine all this, they deal with the invisible realities of knowledge, as in the case of witchcraft, but they complicate the visible ones. And in that complication, they will lead us to bigger issues of ontologies and epistemologies. And I will deal with just if, uh, if, a few aspects of them in relation to notions of that which we call an indigenous knowledge system, different from how we frame knowledge in the Western academy. So let's call the identification of your own examples, which I don't know, but take any example as part of a larger project. It's a larger project. It's going to be larger beyond you because the questions you are going to pose will connect to a larger body of ideas. And each example you take, whether you take words or proverbs or shrines or beads, you, it will connect you to our indigenous thought systems. And the insertion of the entire range of vernacular epistemologies into the former education system. To ignore the ritual archives is to undermine the origins of our collective epistemologies, as well as the historical circumstances of our location in the modernist projects. Civilizations are many and are different, 
and so too are their historical experiences and trajectories. And I'm citing the works that you, some of you have read, because last year, Puebla came up here, um, and some of you are familiar with some of those ideas. Uh, let me skip uh, those, that conversation. Intellectual projects have emerged around the issues of domination. A series of anti-colonial writings emerge around the subaltern epistemology of giving voice to the marginalized and peripheries of empire. A wide range of ideas under the rubric of post-colonial studies. All these ideas have spoken to hybridity and some other ways. Cultural theories, they've engaged their divisions, very knowledge and values. Why those in the African Academy have adopted many of these great epistemological insights? We have not fully imprinted ourselves upon them by drawing from our own heritage and cultural resources. The continent of the dominated and the oppressed, but it keeps drawing more and more from the theories and ideas of those who oppressed and dominated it. Organization cannot be divorced from domination as both were built upon the history of slavery and racism. The insertion of Africa into the modern world and the tests produced by Africans are entangled with notions of race and domination. The core ideas that foreground them revolve around exploitation, domination, and conflict. Many of the subjects we inherit are shaped by those core ideas. Indeed, modernity is entangled with coloniality. Our task is not to reject modernity, but to disentangle it from race and domination. Ritual archives offer us the possibilities of creating knowledge that can become integrated into the process of that disentanglement. Together, capitalism and coloniality have imposed a knowledge divide. The core represents the center of power where universal ideas are generated. The peripheries are colonies where internally generated ideas are categorized as local. The status of researchers in both worlds is not the same and the relevance of their research outcomes are equally unequal. Re the researchers at the core produce methods and theories and those in the periphery consume and apply them. It's as if this core periphery divide will remain with us. Core is producing theory and methods That's, and peripheries are consuming and reproducing it. One way to break this divide because we have to break it, is actually to turn to ourselves and to turn to our archives to create alternative pathways. Decolonizing paradigms based on indigenous knowledge systems. Just as we live in different parts of the world, we can also engage in different ways of thinking. Categories of analysis like words in test are not neutral. And I've taken an example from a Yoruba culture. And Femi, I saw him demonstrating greetings and telling you how to greet and things like that. Uh, where is he now? Uh, uh, and I just want to take an example. Uh, a few examples, say, from the culture where it comes from. Uh, a concept of Iwa, which people have translated into character in English, how you behave the norms of expectation in your family, in your household. When you're looking for the equivalences, we misinterpret them. The breakdown of Iwa, and which we translate and character, are contextualized within specific cultures. A gentleman in England is not necessarily expected to be generous, as in the Iwa, associated with the equivalent among the Yoruba. Iwa cannot be translated as character because it's linked to a broader category of what is expected of you in society, which deals with a larger terrain of virtues and morality and linked with aesthetics, as in saying, your good character is your beauty. A Christian in New York 
may not mean the same as a Christian in Pretoria. Where witches, oh, where witches roam the streets, <laughs> where you have invisible enemies everywhere, including your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so the concept of enemy, when you, when you, when you take your indigenous form, it, it's, it's, it's English equivalence doesn't work. It does not work. The enemy to the Christian in New York is so far inferior to the enemy that we have in Africa. The one in New York does not have the wings to fly to the system floor of an apartment building. <laughs> Whereas ours can turn into tin hair. The enemy in New York may be identifiable by name and occupation, but look at us, and I give so many examples in which that concept, that very concept of enemy, when you break it down, is far more extensive. In the household, enemy within, enemy from the outside or enemy without, enemy in the family and the lineage, enemy at the place of work, enemy believed to be from heaven, you can't appease him, <laughs> you can't placate him, <laughs> secret or hidden enemy, persistent enemies, one is always angry at you, he wants you to die, Your enemy can be the one who knows you, is your best friend, but he does evil to you. The, 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 I just take that one example of indigenous concept. And when you look at the English equivalence, it does not work. Because as then opens up into so many examples. And I also use in this essay what you call a proverb. That proverb in English is, I think we should even stop using it. Because it just doesn't work. Uh, it doesn't work in any African language, and then you take it and you just say it's a proverb. Uh, there are significant differences, and the equivalences are so misleading. And, uh, and there's so many examples you can use how all the examples lead us to non-Western meanings. And that, that's the point I'm trying to make. Ideas of the cosmos and alternate philosophies. The binary between what we call heaven and heart generates different meanings from other epistemologies. With us here in the world are humans, deadly reality, which may include other beings, invisible people that you don't see that we tend uh, to carry along in terms of how we define meanings. Uh, we've tried in, in a number of decolonization projects, but in decolonizing the various curricula, what our pioneer scholars embark upon, which is very worthy, created a lot of achievements, but with limitation. They went to school in the West, and the majority among them accepted Western values and various aspects of Western lifestyles. They understood and worked with Western methods, concepts, and approaches that were never abandoned, even if occasionally questioned. In seeking decolonization, economic freedom, as well as peace and justice, their main contribution related to the application of those Western concepts, approaches, and theories to the African condition. That is a process of adaptation. Some attempts were made to indigenize receive ideas, but not always successfully. It was difficult for the nationalist pioneers to break their linkages with the West. The efforts and struggles were directed at imitation, the creation of Western archives and educational institutions. While they recognized the relevance of oral texts and traditions, these were weakly integrated into the knowledge systems. Indeed, there are many works that explain oral traditions but only a handful of books and essays are based on them. Yet without developing indigenous knowledge, the epistemic linkage between Africa and the colonized geopolitics of epistemology will not go away. Without an aggressive decolonization of knowledge, ancestral knowledge will never find its deserved pride of place. I want to move to the third part, which I will skip, uh, that if you want to look for 
where we are going to create greater relevance, we have to, uh, as I've argued, begin to elevate what we have and begin to use them. Uh, Western experiences shape what we label as universalism. To challenge this domination, we have to accept a new intellectual order, that of pluriversalism. As to the domineering impact of universalism, many scholars have spoken, and I don't have to convince you. Scholarship in a global context operates in zones of power and marginality. Scholars and tests are not equal, just as nations are not equal. This inequality affects the production and consumption of knowledge. Within nations, women are treated unequally, and so too are the narratives they produce. If Christianity and Islam are treated as superior, so too will they treat African ritual archives as inferior. Global and international inequalities are reflected in domination of people, places, races, classes, genders, and the ideas associated with them and what they produce. Once a global social order is constructed, it is supported by an unequal epistemological order in which those above its power hierarchies lay claim to universalism and consign others to parochialism. In the case of Africans and the African diaspora, in relation to their archives, the template of modernity imposed on their being and historical processes has involved otherizing based on ignorance uh, in ways that others have defined. Power shapes knowledge which is obviously not neutral and free of contest. Even our own stories around our animals and spider are not devoid of interest and agenda. Many of these stories are not power free as they are shaped by patriarchy. Stories around why women were not kings is shaped by patriarchy. So too is global knowledge and how it is circulated through the instrumentalities of advanced technologies. It is one culture that foregrounds ritual archives, which gives it the requisite power, autonomy, and agency. The use of ritual archives is one major way to recover the past in ways that we decolonize Western-based academic spaces and Western-derived knowledge system. Knowledge of praise within geopolitics. On the one hand, it is not difficult to track what is owed to Western scholarship, as scholars invoke such works. But what is it that we hold to our own people? What we have been unable to track is how we hold a lot to our own organic epistemologies. And we should begin to track them. And I want to close so that you can ask as many questions as you want. I want to take this archive to the public. And I hope you will join me in this project. Whether as test or as objects or symbols, ritual archives have faced serious dangers, ranging from extinction, ridicule, marginalization, erasure. The first problem is that of intellectual inequality. All externally derived knowledge systems, Islamic and Western, are regarded to be superior to them. The inability to create permanent written tests with specialists linked to formal system of knowledge, as in the case of Western derived academies, has created its own drawback. The social context of knowledge production is crucial, and this is a second source of trouble. African scholars who produce knowledge for Africa globalize knowledge instead of fully embracing and central epistemologies and then linking them to that which they seek. It is important at this crucial point to retreat that we need a three recovery mission. First, we must validate serious empirical work. We must generate a series of dialogue between empirical data and multiple theories. And we must use ritual archives to create distinctive theories. Rather than always seek, taking theories from other knowledge systems, we should use ritual archives to generate theories for others to use. Doing history, philosophy, and theory without basing them on our own unique data and experience is the equivalent of talking about a forest without trees. 
the generators and creators of these archives are equally undermined. There have been systemic and deliberate attempts to destroy them, to destroy what they have created, and to silence their voices. Where they, are, where they operate as their own archivists, to take knowledge to public spaces, they have knowledge, but they lack power. In cases where they are drawn into university spaces, as you have in some examples that I've given, we simply record their voices and abandon them. Indeed, the broad terrain of ritual archivists and indigenous researchers, researchers is usually embattled. We don't, we don't respect them, we don't remunerate them, and we, don't, we just use them as sources and we discard them. It is important to point out that our entire research and academic orientation must be modified or changed towards an active partnership in collaboration with indigenous researchers and practitioners. In Africa, the complaint is always about Western domination of discourse and intellectual production. However, within Africa itself, forms of internal colonization or balkanization of ideas exist, whereby those with formal education in the Western derived academies exercise near supreme power as a baptized elite. This power subordinates others on oppress on three faulty premises. I hope they will let me leave the building. <laughs> because I want to criticize my colleagues now. <laughs> the first premise is that university-based scholars are the researchers, and those outside of it are the suppliers of raw materials. This dichotomy is false. The indigenous way of knowing is a form of research. As difficult as what we do, nobody creates songs, dance, poems, stories without one form of research or another. They have to create words. Bands have to be arranged. Performances have to be fashioned and refashioned. You cannot make the point that a chanter or a dancer does not carry out research to do their work. You can, you can claim that. They are essentially methodologists as well as researchers. They evaluate inherited knowledge and create the tools and networks to repackage and present them. The second relates to what I see as the outcome of research. The assumption that the research generated within universities that is the, is the most important is misleading. Indeed, indigenous researchers connect with their organic communities directly, with locals feeding the constitution of knowledge and the ways of knowing. Local values and indigenous traditions shape their data and knowledge. Indeed, they are social agents in ways that academically trained scholars lack the full capacity to become. As active social agents, they ultimately contribute to the transformation of the spaces they occupy. And this leads me to the third point. The assumption that the power of social agency lies in academic scholars, why it is true to a point is exaggerated. Social agency lies in number, the ability to mobilize that number, and how the mobilization connects with broader goals and agenda that resonates with communities. Communities have the capacity to transform themselves far more than scholars can transform them. As social agents, the tests and objects they produce have immediate values. They exist in societies and not on shelves in scholars' homes. Thus, we have to rethink how we produce knowledge as well as the connections we make. Let's be more civil so that our privileges will not be treated as right to the point of arrogance and the breakdown of bridges. We have to encourage indigenous practitioners to be part of a larger ac academic community, not just studying what they produce, but creating a dialogue of respect and returning back to the community our own products for their use and validation. Diversity of knowledge is crucial to the need to grant our experiences and formulate collaborative strategies to elevate the disciplines and society. Let me query you. Who are we anyway? You and I, who are we? Who are we? After all, we write about the social we write about the sociology of knowledge, not necessarily by building on indigenous inheritances, but by appropriating indigenous voices into chaotic global discourses. 
We write about the sociology of social movements without joining the working class to protest injustice. We write about gods and goddesses without joining their worship except as observers. Indeed, the Christians among us actually have little respect for them. We even write about peasants, traders, and daily lives of the ordinary people. Why are you seeing those writings as steps in the academic ladder? We draw on the data of the traders and market women, but leave them behind as we become professors while they remain in their slums. Let me invoke the word of Puebla. Our sociology of our own practices as researchers, as scientists, as persons of blood and flesh is still pending. Measures to evaluate what you and I do and the impact of our work on development and our role as social agents have not been undertaken. That's a research challenge to Timali. Indeed, in many instances, we actually do not know. We, we do not have a way of measuring our impact. Indeed, we lack a body of work on why Africans take to the academy as a profession. What ethics guide our research and what responsibilities we owe to the larger society. New bodies of work must review the wide range of our activities and our social responsibility of scholars. We must see through our own internal self-assessments and beyond the propaganda claim of inaugural lectures for the validity of our disciplines. We must formulate criteria to assess our relevance after taking several intellectual liberties, with your kind permission, let me close with five practical issues that we can achieve right away. First, let's locate our ritual archives and the communities. We should begin the process of compilation and updating our catalogs. Ritual archives already exist in many private spaces, as well as public institutions. There are hundreds of associations and collectives that we have to promote. It has become urgent to preserve various aspects of these archives, to collect and circulate them. The easiest and most obvious is for researchers to follow the traditional path of data collections through interviews and recordings. Thus far, thus far, those materials reside in private hands, but we have to release them to the larger public. Why the preservation of what individuals collect stay in private hands, and they are good for research agendas, they do create limitations to sharing them. Second, we have to encourage autobiographies, autoethnographies, religious ethnographies, coupled with the creation of rich data banks by practitioners of various practices, religio both religious and seculars. We have to encourage them to write. We have to digitize them, and digitizing them we make them available to the larger public. We have to pay attention to the ongoing research and legal frameworks in South African indigenous knowledge system. Figure out how they work better, evaluate them, and sell them to other African universities. Um, there's a good beginning in some ways around IKS and how we have to apply them to the sciences and technologies. I'm calling for the reconfiguration of the disciplines. The colonial structure of the old and the very new universities has not created a hospitable place and role for ritual. Will institutions allow a PhD dissertation to be written with ritual archives, not just data, but as epistemologists? Will they allow you to write dissertations in Zulu? But we have to. I can understand opposition to this in an American or European universities, where hegemony maintenance is crucial. But what about in Nigeria or Brazil or South Africa? Some professors have to take up my challenge and begin a set of innovations. Will the African Academy nurture dissertations in African epistemy? Would institutions fund research on ritual archives? Practical steps have to follow conceptual innovations. If we continue to conduct field work, who does the coordination and the archiving? We need to ask other questions. In the age of science and technology, what will indigenous knowledge production ultimately translate to? Will it generate ideas for jobs? 
will they connect to technological innovations? And then there's a question of administrative power and resources. Those who distribute resources follow structures of patriarchy and hierarchies. How do we change them? We have to maneuver in redefining research agendas without confronting the hegemonic forces that govern institutional resources and professional advancement. If so, the balance must be delicate. Keep in mind that not all young scholars will have the political maturity to pursue research agendas without making explicit the confrontation. My proposal involves confrontations. I will be the first to, to admit to that. And we don't want to devastate individual career or dismantle a department. One way of framing the issue is the extent to which African academies, academics are operating with epiphenomenal Euro-American epistemologies based on internalized racism as a legacy of colonialism against the extent to which they operate within those framework as a way of aligning themselves with the realities of global and state power. So I, I fully understand the issues of power and the dynamics of fight within the academy. And I also understand the issues around generation. It's difficult for me to appeal to those in their 60s and 70s, but easier to appeal to many of you in this room. And I understand the generation, issues around generational shift and issues around agenda. But we have to give hope to the younger generation that they need not abandon and they should urgently reclaim their common traditions as they their research agendas and academic identities. And we should ask the older generation of academics, those in the leadership and administrative positions, to create space for younger people to rethink many of these issues. The theoretical implications of my ideas are complex. The uses to which ritual archives can be put are complex, and the outcomes will be revolutionary. African languages will flourish in the process. The archives will expand. African language intellectuals will multiply in number. African forms of knowing will become the core of humanistic scholarship in its practical and contemplative manner. If you are convinced, perhaps the discovery of a new core areas will reorganize and relabel the disciplines, revalorize imaginative forms of knowing, and see value in ritual practices, performances, ceremonies, crafts, observation, skills, and agriculture. Alphabetical technologies will grow because we understand them more, further encouraging new creative projects, perhaps respect for indigenous religions, preference for the use of languages, recognition of all forms of oral text, and attention to translation will unleash an intellectual revolution. Perhaps legitimacy will be accorded to indigenous epistemologies, and we will reduce our energy in borrowing and adapt adaptations. Perhaps the traditional intellectuals will stop abusing and marginalizing the organic intellectuals. Perhaps we will preserve, refound, rediscover, recover our pre-colonial knowledge, collective memories, and genealogies. Perhaps we will put a break to the path towards the cultural void that we are now treading. That we will overcome identity and religious ambiguities. Perhaps we will stop the estapetos of indigenous cultures hiding under the mask of modernization. Perhaps estapetian religious priests will have their powers curbed. And perhaps new exemplars of knowledge will replace the older ones. Maybe a new order of indigenous knowledge system will engage as a new intellectual order. And imagine the exemplars will find answers to the hegemonic projects of universalism. A person who carries a basket of eggs on his head must walk with measured steps. In the final analysis, you and I as practitioners, operating in the Western academies, we ultimately become the traditional intellectuals whose power and legitimacy will be challenged and superseded by ideas of organic intellectuals, whose powers and legitimacy will be based on epistemologies derived from ritual archives as well as 
intellectual rationality built on cultural legitimacy. We must continue to read, write, and be a witness at home and abroad, and to cite Musaka. If there were no writer, our paths would fade away, and if there were no reader, our knowledge would vanish. Thank you.